Good morning. Fairly obviously, I'm not Pastor Cheryl. Um, she is gone today, but we have her. She has recorded her sermon, so I am the liturgist and a little bit more this morning. So welcome. Welcome to all of you here, um, and welcome to our Facebook folks, our Facebook congregation. Um, we're happy to have you here this morning on this beautiful sunny day. Um, Cheryl will be back in the office tomorrow. Um, she's just been gone for a couple of days. A few announcements. Um, you've, most of them are on the back of the bulletin for you to look at. Um, Chancel Choir is not singing this morning. You can notice that on your bulletin. Just kind of ignore it. It was a miscommunication. Um, a couple of things to remind you of. If you are, intend to... Um, buy some Easter flowers to help decorate our sanctuary for Easter. Um, tomorrow is the very last day. Robin has to call that order in tomorrow morning. And she said if you haven't done it yet and want to, just let her know today. And even if you don't have the money, you can get the money to her later, but she needs to know by tomorrow morning. Um, and this week, Wednesday starts Lent. Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. We will have Lenten services at 7 o'clock on Wednesday evenings through the whole Lenten season. Um, and this Wednesday is also Messy Church. So it'll be a busy day. Yes, Robin. It's also a noon service on Wednesday. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, on Wednesday for Ash Wednesday, um, there's a noon service as well here. At what time, Robin? Noon. Noon. Oh, <laughs> sorry. That's okay. I'm not quite as comfortable up here as I could, as I could be, I guess. Um, anybody else have any announcements? Okay. Let's start our service this morning then with hymn 384. from 
please join me in the call to worship. We come together today in awe and wonder before the God we worship. We also come burdened down with the worries of the world and the struggles of our individual lives. But in the midst of the worries and the struggles is God, our radiant source of love and hope. We worship together today in awe and wonder to worship the God who transforms our lives. Let us say the unison prayer together. Reveal Reveal your your presence presence to us us this day, day, O God God of light, love, and glory, as you did to your servants at the foot of the mountain. Send your spirit to show us your story. May the brilliance of your face illuminate this place as we dare to proclaim your word. And may we, your people, be never unable to tell all that we have heard. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 through chapter 4, verse 2. So, since we have such a hope, we act with great confidence. We aren't like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the Israelites couldn't watch the end of what was fading away. But their minds were closed. Right up to the present day, the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. The veil is not removed because it was taken away by Christ. Even today, when Moses is read, A veil lies over their hearts. But whenever someone turns back to the Lord, the veil is removed. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Lord's Spirit is, there is freedom. All of us are looking with unveiled faces at the glory of the Lord as if we were looking in a mirror. We are being transformed into the same image. From one degree of glory to the next degree of glory. This comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is why we don't get discouraged, given that we receive this ministry in the same way that we received God's mercy. Instead, we reject secrecy and shameful actions. We don't use deception, and we don't tamper with God's word. Instead, we command to ourselves everyone's conscience in the sight of God by the public announcement of the truth.
Thank you very much. That was lovely. <clears throat> Our next scripture reading is from Luke, chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. About eight days after Jesus said these things, he took Peter, John, and James and went up on a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes flashed white like lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him. They were clothed with heavenly splendor and spoke about Jesus' departure, which he would achieve in Jerusalem. Peter and those with him were almost overcome by sleep, but they managed to stay awake and saw his glory, as well as the two men with him. As the two men were about to leave Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good that we're here. We should construct three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he didn't know what he was saying. Peter was still speaking when a cloud overshadowed them. As they entered the cloud, they were overcome with awe. Then a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Even as the voice spoke, Jesus was found alone. They were speechless and at the time told no one what they had seen. The last reading is from John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. It was still the first day of the week. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors, because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. This ends the readings. Good morning, everyone. I am here to share a message with you this morning via video. Mark and I are out of town this weekend, but um, I wanted to make sure that I left you with something. So no, you don't get away without a sermon today. This is the last week of our That's Not in the Bible series, and it's also what is called the Transfiguration of the Lord's Sunday. And we'll get into that in, in a moment, but first I'm going to recap the last three weeks of our worship series. Last week we covered two sayings. The first was, God only helps those who help themselves, and the second was, money is the root of all evil. And we learned that money is not the root of all evil. It is the love of money that is the root of all evil. And we learned that that was in First Timothy. And it's that two-word phrase that we just take out, love of, and we assume that we can just blanket say money is the root of all evil. But it's really the love of money and how that can replace God in our lives. And it falls right in with the commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so when we love our money and our stuff more than we love God or love our neighbors, we are breaking that commandment. And we also talked about how God helps those who help themselves, and God helps those who can't help themselves through us. And we talked about how we can't be the judge of people, that Jesus says that we are to love our neighbors, and when someone needs something from us, if they need our jacket, we give them our shirt also. And that we have to learn to be generous because it is good for our spiritual health. And that God sends helpers to help us through things when we get down on our luck and need things, and we are those helpers for people. So we talked about all of that. Then the week before that, we talked about how sometimes we say God won't give you more than we can handle and how that's not helpful because that's not how God works. God doesn't give us trials and tragedies because many times things happen and it's not as a result of anything that we have done. But God does promise to walk with us through all of them and God again sends helpers and that is us. 
And we are those helpers in our community of faith as we help each other walk through the trials and the tragedies of life and help each other carry the burdens when they're too heavy. And when we began our series, the first week we talked about how everything happens for a reason. Not. Again, in that same vein, that is not a helpful saying when someone is going through something where they are suffering or they have lost a loved one. Because we believe that God does not control our lives like we are puppets. God knows everything about us, yes. And we do believe that God is in control, but God created us in God's image, in love, and out of that same love, God gave us choice. And God gave us freedom to choose our responses. And so to say that everything happens for a reason would imply that God would give a child cancer in order to teach a lesson, and we do not believe that that is in line with God's message of love. And so today we move on to when God closes a door, God opens a window. And we're also looking at the story of Jesus and his three closest disciples on the mountaintop when Jesus opened a window into who he is. But I want to begin by saying that I don't think God goes through life closing doors and opening windows. Again, that falls in with the same line of thinking that um, God controls everything that happens to us or that God gives us things in order to teach us lessons or help us to gain strength. That's not the God that we believe in. That's not who God is. And I don't even think that this is in the Bible anywhere. I had to do a lot of research to find anywhere that this might have come from. One writer called it bumper sticker theology. It's one of those sayings that's gained traction, and it's just not true. And one place that I was thinking that it might have come from is Jeremiah 29, verse 11, when the prophet writes that God says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Or even Matthew 7, 7, where where um, the writer says, knock and the door will be opened to you. Maybe that's where it came from. But again, thinking about either of these, and especially the, the Jeremiah phrase, it was written to people in exile, and it does declare that God has a plan. But it says nothing about directly controlling that plan or becoming a doorman. The saying says that God will always provide for you something better. Because doors are naturally, most of the time, bigger than windows. So when we say, when God closes a door, God opens a window, if we want to be encouraging and someone's losing a job that they fought so hard to get, or, and someone else is chosen, and we say, well, don't worry, God won't give you more than you can handle and everything happens for a reason and you know that when God closes a door he opens a window you're saying oh you'll get something else now it might be window sized and you might have to stand on a chair and risk danger to squeeze through it but hey it's better than nothing right um we sound a little ridiculous Now, to transition this to our transfiguration story, and before I do that, I want to go back and say, well, saying that when when God closes a door and opens a window, here's my advice. Don't say it. Think about what you're saying. That something big and lovely like a door into a new opportunity, that God's just going to come and shut that. And maybe God will give you a window to squeeze through. Just don't. But in our scripture of the transfiguration of our Lord, God does open a window. But it wasn't after closing a door. It was a window, a God incidence, a revelation of who Jesus was. And those windows open to us all the time. The Holy Spirit moves through at will, and God works in the world, and we know this. And today in our reading, we hear about Jesus taking Peter, John, and James, his three closest friends, up the mountain to pray. And as Jesus is praying, he was transformed and transfigured right before their eyes. 
The appearance of his face changed and his clothes flashed white like lightning. And two men, Moses and Elijah, were seen talking with him. And they were clothed with heavenly splendor and spoke about Jesus' departure, which he would achieve in Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were almost overcome by sleep, but they managed to stay awake and saw his glory as well as seeing the two men with him. And then when they descend, Jesus will encounter the hard way of the cross and his companions will be challenged to practice faithful discipleship. But while all this was happening, Peter, the bumbling disciple, was so overcome with what he was seeing that he wanted to prop that door open. He wanted to enshrine it, to capture it so it would live on. And Luke says he, meaning Peter, didn't know what he was saying. Then the cloud came and the voice that declared to them who Jesus was. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Even as the voice spoke, Jesus was suddenly found alone. The disciples were speechless. And at the time, they told no one what they had seen. Now, God, Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, we read the same story from Mark's perspective. And Mark writes that Jesus told the three disciples not to tell anyone what they had seen or heard. Now, I'm thinking maybe that was a little bit like reverse psychology, because obviously, they weren't going to keep that a secret. They had been offered a window into the divine nature of Jesus, that Jesus was truly God in human form. Now, I added in the last scripture from John as well about how Jesus appeared to his disciples after the resurrection. And I did that a little tongue-in-cheek because we're thinking about doors and windows because it shows that God doesn't even have to open a door or a window because there are no barriers to God or God's love and peace. Now, going back to windows, when I was growing up, of course, we didn't have remotes to the TV. I think there's a saying or a meme on social media that as children, we were the remote. Your parents commanded a, ch a channel, and you actually had to walk over to the TV and turn the dial. Now, kids today probably don't get that. But my dad would get annoyed because a lot of times I would walk over to the TV and even before I turned the channel or after I turned it, I would get caught up with what was on TV and forget to move. And his favorite saying was, you make a better door than a window, and I would know to move. Now, I thought about this, and I've continued to think about it in my life now. How does my life now today reflect God's love and compassion? Am I a window for Christ? Or am I a door that is used to mark off space or keep things and people out? Now, maybe I've told this bef you, to you before, I'm not sure, but um, my personality by nature is an introvert. I'm good with silence. I'm fine with it being quiet, and I'm okay being alone. So a door is a natural way for me to keep my space nice and quiet. However, I have also learned that in order to serve God, I have to let people in. I have to open the door. It kind of has to be one of those doors that's all windows like we have in the back of the sanctuary. Or where you've got the, um, the double doors, the screen door, and then the heavy door. So that people can see into my life and my heart. Now, leaving your windows open all the time takes vulnerability. Because you have to be willing to let others see you. But also to let your light shine out. And for some like me, this takes practice and lots of prayer. And I'm pretty sure my dad was right on some level when he called me a door. At least in my younger years, it's safer, it's comfortable, it's my space, and I don't have to share it. Being a window means that others can share my space. But this is what God calls us to be. And in looking back on the story of the transfiguration, and what we know happens afterwards, we know this isn't going to be easy because it's the nitty-gritty work of being the hands and feet of Christ. But we also have to remember that we are not the light. Christ is. 
but we are the ones who get to share that light with others and let it shine through us. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Lord's Spirit is, there is freedom. All of us are looking with unveiled faces at the glory of the Lord as if we were looking in a mirror. We are being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to the next degree of glory. Now this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This God of doors and windows, of mirrors and glory and all things, wants nothing more than for us to shine brightly and remember who Christ is, our Savior. May it be so. Amen. Christ, whose glory fills the skies, Christ, the true, the only light, Son of righteousness, arise, triumph for the shades of night, day spring from on high be near, day star. Beautiful God, you are our saving grace, both in times of joy and in times of trouble. We are a sinful people. Forgive us for all the ways we disappoint you. Um, try as we might. We thank you. We have gratitude for your daily care. You provision us. You protect us. Um, and we... Thank you for that. We ask for your help for those we have mentioned and those who are in our hearts that we haven't spoken about aloud. Be present with them and with all of us. Grant us all peace. Grant us healing, comfort, and the knowledge that you are there for us no matter what. We pray all of this as your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below.
Please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving. Transforming God, we come to your altar this morning, knowing that in our giving and in our living, we have often put just enough into living our faith so as to not to impact our lifestyle or cause too much discomfort. We have been reluctant to let go of our affinity for things of this world. And in our attachments, we have often missed the opportunity for the transformed lives you desire for us. May our offering this morning be an invitation to living a life radically transformed by your power, love, and grace. We pray this in the mighty love of Jesus. Amen. Shining the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to the whole world. And God's, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. 